On this episode, I offer you a heartwarming David and Goliath tale about the son of a surgeon who watched dad work, only to get into the family business by improving upon the tools of his forefathers. I have to say one of the proudest moments that we've both had is when he did our first surgery in the United States in 2014. It was a really proud moment to be in the same operating room that we were in seven years before then, thinking out loud about the possibility of creating something that helped him and helped his colleagues deliver better outcomes for their patients. Hello, I'm Michael Hainsworth. The CIBC Innovation Banking Podcast explores the world of startups, growth stage companies, and late stage companies that have made a big splash in their industries around the world. Armin Bakertzian's IntelliJoint Surgical offers smart navigation for joint replacement surgery. The precision Bakertzian's tools provide ensure patients aren't readmitted over improperly installed replacements or need a little lift in one shoe thanks to a leg length change. But Kurtzian didn't intend to get into the family business, but in a roundabout sort of way, he did. I mean, having an orthopedic surgeon as a father, you almost uh, get conditioned to like medicine and to like orthopedics. Actually, first time I was in the operating room, I was a young boy at eight years old watching an ankle plate for the first time. So it was something that's been ingrained in my mind for a long time. And of course, I've always had interest in medicine, interest in how people move and function. And I've always been attracted to engineering as well. So you know, orthopedics is a great combination of medicine and engineering. It sort of reminds me of uh, the stereotype of the the kid helping dad with the car and he's got to hold a flashlight. You had a very medical 20th century version of that experience. It started out of a need. My dad is an orthopedic surgeon and orthopedic surgeons doing hip and knee replacements uh, to rely on their training and their judgment uh, in order to make sure the procedure goes really well. And my dad was, you know, very blunt in saying that orthopedic surgeons, you know, sometimes they do make mistakes and it would be great to have a a device or a technology that helps, helps them improve the outcomes of their patients and helps avoid mistakes. But ultimately you went into the business more from an engineering perspective and help us understand as to what got that minimal viable product off the ground in the first place. Mm -hmm. It really started from a need. Orthopedic surgeons doing hip and knee replacement surgeries want to deliver the best possible care um, for their patients. And, you know, we wanted to create a, a device that helped them do that. But it, of course, it didn't violate some of the other things that orthopedic surgeons in hospitals care about, which is, you know, ease of use, which is speed, which is integration with workflow. So we really did take an engineering approach to solve a real problem. And, you know, after we started the company in 2010, it took us just over three years to go from prototype to an approved medical device um, that was being used in surgery for the first time. So listening to orthopedic surgeons, listening to their needs and to their problems and to their constraints and really treating it as an engineering problem is what helped us get there. But what made you think you knew better than the established competitors Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. And I think um, entrepreneurs inherently are optimistic. They are focused on solving problems. And I think they don't shy away from any challenges. And of course, entering into a market with titans, of course, I think that's the mindset you must have, because otherwise, you know, you probably wouldn't get started in the first place. So you know, I don't think we knew better than them. I think our approach was a bit different that we didn't consider just the clinical problems, but we also considered the environment in which that care is delivered. And we understood that older navigation devices violated some of those uh, really important things that surgeons and hospitals care about, which is why they didn't unfortunately get adopted the way that they deserved. So when we started out, we wanted to ensure that that core value was preserved, but at the same time, we didn't violate those things that traditional navigation violated. So I think our scope was a bit broader. We were focused not only on the clinical benefit, but also the integration with the workflow and the integration into what hospitals and orthopedic surgeons are currently doing. 
The medical community is notoriously conservative about making new bets. Building a better medical mousetrap is no guarantee surgeons will beat a path to your door. But with more than a decade under its belt already, how did IntelliJoint succeed in getting its gear installed in operating rooms across Canada and the United States? And how do you fight established competitors for that coveted OR shelf space? In our case, we aren't necessarily fighting the Goliaths. Um, we're fighting really the fact that most orthopedic surgeons today do not use navigation or robotics in their procedures. Um, they rely on their training and their judgment. And historically, that has provided a good outcome for patients. But we view it as, you know, there's room for improvement. You know, the, the procedure is not perfect. And really what we're trying to encourage and convince is that orthopedic surgeons can benefit and their patients can benefit from adopting our technology. And since we don't really get in their way while they're doing the surgery, our opinion is why shouldn't they use us on every procedure? Because it's easier to get fooled than you think. A patient is underneath a drape. They have such a small opening that the surgeon can see. The patient moves under the drape. And unfortunately, surgeons can get fooled by things like this. And it's really the technology that helps them in bounds, if you will, while they're positioning implants or they're trying to select the size of their implants. So then I can imagine the role of early adopters in your technology is pretty critical. They, they would almost act as evangelists for the work you're doing. Of course. And I think, you know, in every industry, in every sector, there are champions, there are early adopters. And that is probably one of the most important things going into medical devices because having a colleague speak to another surgeon, speak to the benefits of a technology, ultimately that's the strongest pitch that can be made to a prospective customer. And we not only had those surgeons adopt our products first, they were also our designers. You know, these early adopter surgeons can make the mental leap that if I place implants in the body more accurately, my patients are going to do better. Whereas, you know, the, the later adopters want to see more clinical evidence, they want to see economic data and things like that. So the evangelists, the key opinion leading surgeons are extremely important in design. They're extremely important in early adoption and they're extremely important in generating that clinical research that ultimately leads to broader adoption in the marketplace. You mentioned, though, the economics of it as well. What role does that play in a decision by a doctor or a hospital in deciding to go with your technology? It's an important consideration. And where we have innovated is not only in the technology itself, but the technology enables a different business model for us. So, for example, we do not charge hospitals any capital. Intelligent can come into a hospital and we can start doing procedures without a capital purchase being made um, by the hospital. It's We simply charge a fee every time the device is used. So that makes it an easier decision for hospitals. But ultimately, you know, the surgeon is the champion. They are advocating to the hospital for the adoption of a particular technology. And it's really incumbent on the company and the surgeon to show not only does it provide clinical benefit, but it provides economic benefit as well. And as the healthcare systems around the world become more focused on value-based procurements, that's what they want to achieve. They want to achieve clinical benefit and economic benefits. Unfortunately, one or the other generally is not enough. You need to do both. That's fascinating that you've built a technology that instead of saying this is a $500,000 piece of equipment or what have you, that instead it's more of surgery as a service. It's SaaS uh, turned on its ear. Uh, is this the future of your line of work, of, of the medical technology community, is re a recurring revenue model this way? It's definitely what we've seen more of in the marketplace. I think it makes sense for a reason. It's lower risk to adopt from a hospital's perspective. Yes, maybe it's a little bit more risk from the company's perspective because they're placing equipment without having it paid for. But ultimately, in the long run, 
we earn more margin. So it is beneficial for us in the long run. It's beneficial for the hospital in the short term. And it actually has no risk to the hospital because if they want to stop using it at any point, you know, they haven't purchased, you know, a 500,000 piece of equipment. That's what are they going to do with it, you know, after that point? So it provides an easier pathway to adoption. It provides better long-term returns for the company, and it allows the company to generate recurring revenue, which is inherently more valuable than capital revenue. So once you've convinced a, a surgeon or a surgeon group to work with them, and that this not only is a technology that works, but it's also financially viable, how do you go about mobilizing these surgical opinion leaders? You know, I think at first, surgeons take that leap of faith that. For example, in our case, if I place my implants with more accuracy, my patients are going to do better. Then as they adopt and use the technology and they actually see those benefits and those results themselves, I think inherently surgeons and, and doctors in general want to deliver the best care for patients. Yes, for their own patients, but for the patient community at large. So if they see that something they've adopted, something that they're doing is benefiting their patients, I believe they want to share that with their colleagues. They want to share that with you know, other surgeons from other thought centers. They want to do clinical research that shows you know, that their institution or themselves are also thought leaders by adopting early technology and translating that adoption into clinical and economic benefits. So you know, surgeons are, uh, want to deliver the best possible care. They are competitive. So, you know, it, all of these factors really empower surgeons to be champions of technologies and devices that really benefit their patients. And I think that's what gets them excited. So then as an entrepreneur who's mobilizing these people to uh, fly the flag on your behalf, let's talk about that other hat that you have to wear because and the job of engineer, very different than the job of entrepreneur. And, and you once told me that when it comes to that side of your, your job on day one, at the beginning, ignorance was bliss. You didn't know how hard that road would be. You know, in our case, ignorance was definitely bliss in the beginning. In hindsight now, almost 11 years later, I don't think we would do anything different. For me, the big part is that we are actually making such a positive impact on people's lives. And yes, there's been tons of challenges over the years. There's been peaks, there's been troughs in, in our journey. Ultimately, what you know puts a big smile on our face is seeing videos of surgeons posting of their patients postoperatively, that they're up and walking on the same day, that the legs are the same length, that they don't have any complications or any issues. So definitely ignorance is bliss early on, but I think seeing results is what keeps the motivation high and keeps us really focused on building this business into the future. Being a small startup certainly gives a company an advantage over the monolithic established players. Being nimble means reacting to change more quickly, responding to criticism and recommendations with speed, and looking for avenues into a competitive space where there's a demand but little supply. But startups are rife with unexpected early challenges on the path to disruption. Armin says everything from fundraising to building that better mousetrap had tricks and traps of their own. So then let's go from ignorance to knowledge. What were some of those early unexpected challenges you spoke of, of being a small disruptive technology company in this space? It's a great question. I have to pick because there was tons of them. Um, <laughs> I would say if I could pick on two, it would be fundraising as a medical device company. Um, and second, it would be creating a medical device just in general. Fortunately, that medical device companies can't just whip up something in, in the lab and post it online and have users use it. So there's a lot more rigor that, that goes into that type of testing, that type of product development. There's a lot more you know, constraints, a lot more structure around how you develop a product uh, in a medical environment versus outside of a medical environment. So I think that was a big challenge for us. And we were fortunate to be you know, introduced to someone who had done that before that really coached us and guided us. And you know, we've really taken that experience 
that we've gained over the years and try to retain that experience in Canada in our ecosystem in Kitchener and Waterloo because there are few medical device companies that have that experience. You know, Canada is not necessarily well known for creating and commercializing medical devices. So we actually learned from folks in the U.S. and we kind of imported that knowledge into our team. We retained our company in Kitchener um, over the years and now we're trying to pay it forward and really try and educate the next generation of startup on what it takes to develop and commercialize uh, a medical device globally. So you've gone from leveraging mentors to help you get going in those first 11 years to being a mentor yourself. Yes. I mean, we think it's important to to really guide the next generation of company. The benefits to patients, the benefits to you know, our local economy, the benefits to our ecosystem and the benefits to our country for commercializing a medical technology company at home are tremendous. And we want more of those types of stories. We want more companies um, domiciled in Canada. We want more companies commercializing from Canada and selling their products all over the world. You're trying to do all of this amid the worst pandemic in more than 100 years. Mm -hmm. How has this impacted your ability to build out your roadmap? That's a great question. And I think the response is really dependent on what stage companies are at. You know, in our case, we're a revenue generating company. So, you know, with the pandemic and elective procedures being postponed, of course, that impacts our revenue. And that was, you know, true across all of our markets um, in Canada and the US and Australia. Elective procedures were halted almost overnight. So, you know, it was a huge challenge for us. And I think our response was, first of all, to rally together as a team. Secondly, to be fully transparent, open and honest with the challenges that we're facing and the steps that we're taking to not only survive, but thrive in that kind of environment. And, you know, we talked earlier. 